This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Welcome to That's Pediatrics, where we sit down with physicians, scientists, and experts to discuss the latest discoveries and innovations in pediatric health care. Welcome to That's Pediatrics from UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I'm Amanda Pahalik, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Immunology, your host for today. And today our guest is Dori Ortman. Dori serves as family faculty at LEND, which is the Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities of Pittsburgh, a program affiliated with the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She is also LEND's Family and Self-Advocacy Training Director and Clinic Coordinator. In addition to her roles at LEND, Dory is a crisis counselor with Crisis Trends and the administrator of Special Needs Care, a private online group providing community, advocacy, resources, and education to its members, which include parents, caregivers, siblings, and other family members of children, adolescents, and young adults with special needs. Today our topic is the LEND Center and family-centered care for children with developmental disabilities. Thank you so much for being on our show, Dory. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So um, I was hoping that you could start by just telling us a little bit about your background, your path to UPMC Children's, um, and what drew you to your role working with the LEND Center? Absolutely. Um, so way back in another lifetime, it feels like, um, I started off uh, when I first entered college uh, going for business marketing. <laughs> um, but very long story short, in my trajectory, um, I've had a lot of personal experience with disability um, from a very early age, including um, an aunt who was deaf. Uh, my father eventually had a massive stroke and ended up in a wheelchair. Um, so just a lot of personal experiences with disability. And I ended up uh, being the program manager for an organization in Pittsburgh called CLASS, uh, Community Living and Support Services, which is a nonprofit that serves families who have children with disabilities. Uh, I was in that role for 12 years, uh, working with families on a daily basis. Um, I myself am also a mother of two now young adults. Uh, at the time, they were young children, um, and they both have learning differences and um, it just really made me sort of gravitate to that entire system, mm -hmm. um, our nonprofit systems that do serve families who have children with disabilities. So that's your background. Yeah. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the Lens Center formed um, and, how you, and how your role in the Lens Center got started. Absolutely. So LEND actually used to be known as Euclid, um, even when I first started. It started in 1995, mm -hmm. and it was formed by community leaders and university leaders and UPMC Children's Hospital leaders as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Euclid was the name, is U-C-L-I-D, and that was University Community leaders and individuals with disabilities. And so our university leaders, our hospital leaders, um, really sort of gathered around and said, we need to do a formalized program and unite all of us. Um, the founder, really, of the program was Dr. Heidi Feldman, mm -hmm. um, who was with UPMC for many years and um, has since left, but she's really considered a national uh, renowned expert on autism mm -hmm. and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so uh, she started uh, along again with the other community leaders and university leaders in 1995 to form Euclid, which later became LEND. And LEND is funded by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Mm. Um, so when we say it's affiliated with the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, our leadership um, has always come from and continues to come from UPMC Children's Hospital, university leaders. Um, we sort of kept that cohort um, background really strong and continue to pull our leadership from there. So as I mentioned, um, we are funded by the Maternal and Child, Child Health Bureau, MCHB. Well, this is my 12th year with LEND as faculty. 
And so it would have been about 13 years ago, MCHB came out with a mandate. There are around, right now, there are around 60 LEND programs mm-hmm. across the country, okay. um, all housed um, and affiliated with universities and hospitals. Okay. And we train um, a cohort of graduate and doctorate level students in a variety of disciplines who will eventually serve children who do have disabilities. Mm. So these are um, students from different disciplines like occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, social work, child psychology. So, you know, anyone that will um, serve all children, but certainly uh, in our society today have children with disabilities come Mm -hmm. under their care. Mm -hmm. So back to what I was saying about 13 years ago, MCHB came out with a mandate that just as graduate students and doctorate level students come to the table with a vast variety of experience and knowledge, um, lived wisdom, that families also come with that wisdom Mm -hmm. from their own pathway in raising a child with a disability or having a sibling with a disability. And so MCHB came out with the mandate that family had to be its own discipline within the LEND discipline programs across the country. Mm. And so all of the LENDs started scrambling to identify family faculty, which was also sort of part of that mandate, um, so that we could get that curriculum developed and get that um, that discipline basically as a part of our overall cohort. I see. Um, I was very honored that um, my name was sort of thrown into the hat by a few people right here at UPMC Children's Mm -hmm. Hospital uh, as a recommendation for faculty, and I interviewed, and the rest is history. So this is my 12th year. Awesome. That's fantastic. So so the LEND program um, across the country is basically there to help train the, the individuals who are going to go out into the community in a variety of different settings. Um, and work with children with disabilities. And the family portion of that, which you're involved in, the family faculty portion, works with the families together with these um, individuals who need training, graduate students and, and, and doctors and things. Is that kind of how it works? That, that is part of my role, absolutely. We okay. actually have, just as we have trainees from the University of Pittsburgh, we also do have trainees from a couple of other universities nearby as well. Sure. Um, but we have family trainees. Like this year I have uh, two trainees who are both mothers okay. of um, children with disabilities, very complex needs and they are trainees right alongside our graduate doctorate students Um, they act as peers they follow uh, not an identical curriculum because our student trainees have a lot of clinical experiences um, that they participate in whereas our family trainees are more consultants on those clinical experiences because they do bring that uh, lived you know knowledge and wisdom with them Um, The other part of our program that I'm very involved in is our clinic, and that is um, the biggest part that we're affiliated with with UPMC Children's is that we have families um, who do have children with complex needs come for clinic appointments, and then our trainees through LEND work with them with our guidance, with faculty guidance and support and mentorship. Um, but they do get to work directly with the families. Um, we help identify resources for them within the community. Uh, I, I would say our biggest role with families and our biggest support for families is that we help them navigate sort of this complex system that we have for uh, you know, families raising children with disabilities. It can be a really complex system and really difficult to navigate. And that's probably the biggest support that we offer through LEND and that our trainees um, yeah. get to offer. So what, what's really fascinating to me about this is that it sounds like the LEND Center really is serving multiple communities at the same time, right? So Absolutely. on the one hand, you know, we're, you're serving the families that have these needs, that have children with, with disabilities that need all kinds of support, as you just described. Um, but it's also serving the people that are that are going to actually then 
go out into the world and work with those people as well as part of a leadership, a, a sort of a, an education training, right? Um, so really interesting to me that you're sort of serving both roles at one time, helping families, helping patients, also helping train the people who need to go out there and help the families and help the patients outside of the Lens Center, um, really like a dual purpose. And that's that's incredibly interesting to me. So how do you guys do the matching, right? How does a family get referred to the Lens Center? Is that Or is that how that works? Or do you actively need to recruit individuals? Um, is there training programs that sort of automatically work with the Lens Center so that their students get involved in that program? Or is that also something that you need to recruit individuals for? Like, I guess I'm kind of curious as to how you serve both purposes in those training, those communities, train and working with families at the same time, and how it sort of works um, almost on like a day-to-day -day basis. Sure, absolutely. Um, and that's you know probably one of the biggest benefits of being a part of the system of UPMC Children's Hospital and then also the University city of Pittsburgh uh, for that sort of dual purpose because from the university we do recruit our trainees um, it's a very competitive uh, process mm. um, we always have more applicants for our program than okay. uh, we are able to receive because we are a funded program I see so we have very specific guidelines and and even limitations as far as the number of trainees uh, when we first started back in the day as I said in 1995 um, our cohort of trainees was fairly small maybe between six and ten and we've certainly grown and um, now our cohort of trainees is usually around 20, 22. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've certainly grown, but we do always recruit, you know, mm. from the university, from other nearby universities. Pittsburgh, of, of course, is a host of, you know, many sure. wonderful universities. Um, and so, you know, we're always trying to get the word out about that, but it is very competitive. You have to apply to the program. We interview um, and, and, you know, just depending on their leadership skills we always mm -hmm. say we're, we are our goal our purpose our mission is we are training the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. who will serve families who have children with disabilities and children with disabilities themselves and so that's sort of our mission and so yeah we're always trying to put that word out there to recruit yeah trainees or applicant trainees. so I so I, and i do want to come back to the family part absolutely of it. so for the for those of our um, listeners who are you know in the in the process of training because I, I think we do have quite a few listeners that are you know training for for different varieties of of care for, related to children um if you get into the program, how long is the program? Is it like a one-year stint or is it longer? Like, what does that time frame look like? Sure, it is uh, one a one academic year. So typically August through April, we're mm -hmm. actually getting ready to graduate in mm -hmm. a couple weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and so it is one academic year. Okay. Uh, it, it's pretty intense, mm -hmm. and you're sort of adding this on as an as an option to right. your other right. really full course load, <laughs> yes. basically. Yes. and looking for a job because you're getting ready to graduate, unless you're grad, a grad student and moving on to doctor. But many of even our graduate students are preparing to enter the workforce. And so they're adding this on to their coursework. They're looking for a job, interviews, maybe accepting a job and starting. You know, So there's a, it's pretty intensive. We do a lot of different um, activities and projects and, and academics with them. Um, <clears throat> And so, what what so, yeah, defines what sort of successful completion? Kind of what are the key skills that someone would learn during that training process? Is it different? Are there different subset programs within? Like you to do twenty to twenty two um, trainees per year? Do they each undergo the exact same type of training, or is it distinct depending on what um, environment they're coming from? Whether it's uh, you know like occupational therapy or physical therapy, et cetera. Actually, we always say uh, when you walk through the door and lend, if you're accepted and you're a trainee, when you walk through the door at lend, the first thing you need to do is take off your discipline hat ah. because you will probably very rarely um, be speaking or, or doing activities related to your discipline. Mm. We really want them to think more outside the box and how can we look at this family holistically mm. and what kinds of resources might help them. So even if you are just using your example as an occupational therapist and eventually this student will you know become an OT and be working with children, 
Um, when you're working with that child, there are a lot of other things that you might end up seeing that could be really beneficial for them or really helpful and supportive for the family. And if you're able to provide resources to them and suggestions to them on those other areas, your plan and your goals with that child, even in OT, will be so much more successful. Mm. Um, we, we try to teach our trainees to not just think of health care, but to also think of sort of well care, mm. which there are a lot of things that go into overall wellness that mm. we know, of course, socialization, recreation opportunities, being a part of the community, um, and a lot of children with disabilities don't have the same types of opportunities with those types of things oh. as other children. Right, of course. Um, and so we really look at that, you know, does the child have friends? Is the child involved in any programs? Are they getting out there? Or are they isolated, which are happens to a lot of families as well, not just the children themselves, but the families, because sometimes it's hard to take your child with a disability out and people staring or maybe your child has an outburst in a restaurant and a lot of families more than people realize sort of isolate themselves and mm-hmm. that's not that's not well-being for the child that doesn't right. um, relate to sort of overall health care and and we want that we want it to be recognized as a whole as a holistic approach um, and so yeah we, we they really do follow the same curriculum, um, the same projects and activities and leadership skills. Um, It doesn't really depend on their discipline. The only variance is, I would say, is that our family trainees have a very parallel curriculum uh, with a little bit of difference based on goals that they want to achieve afterwards. Yeah, so so I guess this is a good um, transition point to get back to the, the family portion of things. So how do you identify families that are appropriate for the Lens Center? And then um, can you tell us a little about exactly what you were just saying at the end there about how the family's trainees then go through their process? How do they identify what their goals are? And then how do you, how long is that program? Is it also a year? And how does that process work? Absolutely. Uh, so our families, uh, we're very fortunate, uh, come uh, referrals for our families, for our clinic, mostly come from UPMC Children's, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the different departments that end up working. We have a lot of great clinics within our hospital system as well. Um, We have a CP clinic for cerebral palsy. We have uh, various autism programs, um, you know, a lot of different clinics and programs. And so we get a lot of referrals from uh, UPMC Children's. Um, we get children. We excuse me. We get referrals from um, pediatricians mm-hmm. uh, who are aware of us. Uh, we always take the summer to sort of make sure all of the different departments and and um, healthcare systems, you know, remember who we are. Mm. We it, we're fortunate that we don't really have to make a huge push for families. We usually serve because it is part of a training program. It's not really. Um, an appointment, like a healthcare appointment mm-hmm. that ne- mm-hmm. families would maybe receive coming to a different type of clinic. Um, mm-hmm. Our clinic is a little bit different in that uh, it's more like community based and about community resources. And uh, like I had said earlier, helping families navigate systems. So it's not really healthcare based, as in we're not doing um, an exam and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so other clinics and pediatricians and, and those who are aware of us typically refer families to us who are sort of having difficulty not only with navigating the system, but a lot of our families come to us with issues with school systems, um, just trying to better their communication with school systems, Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. needing some support with their child's IEP or individualized education plan, uh, which all children with disabilities have. Uh, and so they're coming to us for resources and support in things almost outside of the realm of what the typical healthcare system does. Mm. Um, but again, because it is a training program, uh, our appointments are limited. So we usually serve around 20 families per year. Uh, so it's not something that we necessarily are, you know, having to knock down doors. You know, we're getting the referrals. Mm-hmm. We're very fortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, we look at what the family's needs are, what their goals are, 
uh, what our students are working on and, mm-hmm. and sort of go from And are you essentially able to take every family that is referred to you, or is there like a wait list in order to get into the program? <clears throat> There's not a wait list at this time. Um, we sometimes do have one once the year gets started. Mm. Uh, sometimes families will come back to us mm. a, a second year, depending, again, on what their goals were, and um, maybe our trainees who are on that team for that family, we do have clinic teams, feel that the family would really benefit from some fluidity, you know, as far as continuing to work on those goals into the coming academic year Mm -hmm. or school year for the child. And so we'll bring them back in the fall. Uh, So it just depends. Uh, We don't have a wait list typically, but sometimes once the year actually gets started, rolling into September, October, we may sometimes have a wait list, but we're typically able to see all of our families over the course of the year. Great. That's fantastic. So um, I wanted to also come back to sort of at the beginning of your introduction talking about how, you know, you had a lot of personal experiences with disabilities in your family and how that really, I mean, I think it's so great that you were able to then move into a career where that clear passion that you have and that experience that you have was able to be leveraged, right, in this incredibly important and positive way. Um, and given the amount of time that you've been in this career path, I'm, I'm really just sort of curious how caring for children with disabilities has changed over time. You know, what kinds of things have you seen um, more recently that have been a po- that have played a positive role in how we think about and care for children with disabilities? Um, and maybe some, some sort of emerging areas that you think um, are still needing to be addressed and, and why we haven't been able to address them yet. Absolutely. Um, so while overall health care I don't think has necessarily changed for families of children with disabilities and the children themselves, I think what has changed um, is navigating that complex system, which I had mentioned mm. earlier, I think has become more and more complex for our families. Um, Mm. We've seen a lot of shifts in uh, mental health, behavioral health issues. Um, There are many vulnerable families. Um, We see a lot of grandparents caring for their grandchildren who have disabilities and having full custody. I think there's just so many stressors on the collective systems, including the healthcare system, the educational system. I had mentioned Mm -hmm. um, school Mm -hmm. being a big issue. Um, And so I think there's a lot of stressors short of, well, some of those things have changed overall. What definitely has not changed is the amount of support that Mm -hmm. families need and that we should be giving them. Mm -hmm. Um, Two areas that we are really focusing on right now uh, uh, through our LEND program are health equity Mm -hmm. uh, for those more vulnerable families, Uh, something that I know we're all striving for uh, when it comes to children with disabilities. It's, um, you know, we just, we really want to make sure they are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. We we really want to make sure they're being supported. We really want to make sure that their families are able to navigate these systems Um, And then another area that we're really looking at is uh, reaching out to rural families or families living in rural areas Mm. who have children with disabilities because the resources that are available to them are very, very limited. And so um, now that we have been through this pandemic and and still Mm -hmm. living within it, I guess, in some way, but... Um, And we've all sort of gotten more up to speed on Zoom meetings Mm -hmm. and appointments and things like that. I think that that really gives all of us an opportunity to really think about how we can better serve families in rural areas Mm -hmm. uh, now that we on our side are sort of more up to speed on all of these virtual possibilities of support. Um, How can we help them? Because some of them don't have internet service. Some of them don't have... Um, a computer to use or something, but yeah. how can we help them get some of this so that we can then support them more when they are so isolated and, and in rural communities, as I was saying earlier about that sort of overall wellness and socialization, you know, when you're in a rural area and, and barely have any resources available, you that only makes it only more challenging for effective health care and yeah. overall wellness. Yeah. What, what kind of additional resources do you feel like the Lens Center needs or could use that would help sort of um, with some of those goals, like reaching out to rural families? Like, so What are the challenges in sort of being able to meet those goals at this point? 
Well, because we are a, a grant-funded program, and we do have to uh, renew. I mean, we're very thankful. We have been around since 1995, but every five years, we do go through a competitive grant renewal with mm-hmm. um, all other lens across the country, but then also uh, new programs that, you know, a university or hospital that say, we want to have a land. And mm-hmm. so now they're submitting an initial application to the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So every five years, we go through a very competitive renewal. So um, all of the support that we can get from the community, um, we often ask community leaders for letters of support when we do mm-hmm. submit our mm-hmm. uh, grant renewals and um just really even this like helping us put the word out about yeah. land and what we're doing and for the community uh, and region really to be aware of that and um for us to just have that recognition mm-hmm. so that we can get support that we when we do reach out to different nonprofits or resources that we're hoping can help these families that People are more aware of what LEND is and what LEND does and wanting to rally around us and um, support us in our missions so that we can then continue receiving that funding from MCHB Mm -hmm. and continue with our mission as well. Fantastic, yeah. Um, I I guess in closing, maybe we could just, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on some some of the really critical partners that you have here in the community currently. Um, and are there any additional partners that you think um, would be- would further benefit sort of having that kind of support? Some of the projects that we have our trainees work on, um, one is State Your Case, mm-hmm. uh, and that is that they research laws and regulations around a particular disability topic, and then they create a an advocacy message to share with the community, with our local legislators. Um, we have our two family trainees actually next week are going down to Washington, D.C. and meeting with legislators mm. on the Hill. They're having Hill visits. And so we're always out there trying to advocate, advocate, advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, And so we have partners that help us with State Your Case. We're always looking for different mentors within the community who are community leaders who somehow have a a stake in serving children with disabilities and their families. And so we have a lot of great individual mentors that I don't even want to mention names because I'll forget someone and I (laughs) I don't want to forget to do that. Is called another one of our projects that our trainees work on is called Community Partners. And that allows them to work with a a nonprofit organization in our community who is already serving children with disabilities, and they work on a project the entire year with that partner. And uh, it really allows them to see the challenges of not only nonprofits Mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, raising funds, and, and these are nonprofits that sometimes hold big fundraisers and galas and you know that can be really challenging but it's where do we find this money to serve the kids Mm -hmm. and that allows them to get that firsthand experience of of those challenges and then um, just really get to know some of the leading organizations in the community so we do have a lot that we work with uh, and that we are so happy that they are partnered with us just some that I'll mention mention right now uh, Achieva we work with a lot Open Up Pittsburgh That's a a newer community organization that offers um, yoga and improv Mm -hmm. classes um, in an inclusive setting. So Mm -hmm. it's um, children and adults without disabilities, but then also they're very welcoming of a variety. They do outreach to all different um, types of underserved populations, uh, minorities, disability, um, LGBTQ. And so those are things that we're always passionate about. When we think about inclusion, you know, we think about mm-hmm. the entire community. So, and disability is, is within that. Yeah. Um, and so Open Up Pittsburgh is another one that's fairly new that is a community partner. Um, the Peel Center. We have just so many great organizations in our area that serve children with disabilities. But of course, you know, we're all, you know, always looking for support. Um, I would just say really any organization that does serve children with disabilities, if they're interested in 
becoming a partner with us or the, the potential to become a partner with us, to reach out to us. We would love to talk to them. If they're interested in being a part of training this mm-hmm. next generation of leaders, mm-hmm. and maybe that's something they're interested in, again, reach out to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would love to talk to them. But yeah, we're always looking for organizations within the community to partner with us to help further advance our mission. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dory. I mean, I just also want to take a moment and thank you for the work that you do serving um, families and children with disabilities. It's such an important part of the work here at UPMC Children's, um, and we're so grateful to have the organization, the Lens Center, and, and you and your colleagues to participate in that. And thank you for your time today to share with us your experience and your, the information about the Lens Center. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on behalf of our entire Lens Center and our entire faculty group. We are so happy to be affiliated with UPMC Children's Hospital and, of course, University of Pittsburgh, where we're housed. Uh, And yeah, thank you for for having me on and hearing about LEND. Great, thanks. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about this podcast or our guests, please visit chp.edu slash that's pediatrics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to keep up with our new content. You can also email us at podcast.upmc at gmail.com with any feedback or ideas for topics you'd like our experts to cover on future episodes. Thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Tune in next time.